You're watching Bread and Roses, a weekly political social magazine that's broadcast in English and Persian by New Channel TV. Hello everyone, I'm Maram Namazi. And I'm Fadi Bospuya. In this week's program, we have our very own Maryam Namazi's speech at the Reason Rally, and she thinks she was a brilliant <laughs> speech, I thought it was. We will discuss the aspects of her speech. It would be interesting to actually discuss it between ourselves. Definitely. We'll also be speaking about the tragic attack on a gay club in Orlando. The anniversary of 20th June 1981 in Iran, we'll talk to you about that. We'll also be discussing Political Prisoners Day in Iran, as well as Ramadan and the drying up of rivers because of women's immoral dress codes in Iran. That's, and that's an uh, insane fact of the week. Yeah, and finally, we have women singing in mosques in Iran. Stay with us. In the week that passed, of course, we've got the tragic events of Orlando. We have an Islamist gunman entering a gay club and killing 49 innocent people who had just gone to have a great night out and they ended up not being able to return home to their loved ones, to their families. I mean, you, you, you see this in Baghdad, in Iraq, in Paris, in Belgium, you see that in Orlando, really is every single one. Mm. It's heartbreaking how many families have to uh, suffer. And really, we, we feel for every single family who is subject of, uh, of people who've actually lost their loved ones. Yeah, I mean, definitely our condolences go out to all the family members. I mean, for me, the most heartbreaking part, th there's so many heartbreaking stories around this, but one of them was when, uh, you know, a mother shows the last text of her son to her where he says, I'm hiding in the bathroom, uh, you know, call the police, um, the gunman is coming, he's killing people, and then, you know, him saying that he's going to die, and then that, that was the end of the text messages. Yeah, and I think at the same time, when you see that tragedy, also, people come together. I mean, we've had demonstrations across mm. the solidarity. People got together in London, in Paris, in different cities, in solidarity with Orlando. And that's, you know, that gives us strength to everybody that the, you know, the core issue and human response to this is solidarity. At the same time, it doesn't matter whether this person, the people are searching whether they had any contact with ISIS or not. This is Islamist ideology. Mm. It doesn't matter wherever they are, they, they, they hate every inch of human freedom, mm. whether it is sexual freedom, normal human life, children, young people, free thinkers, women, you name it, they hate everything and they can't understand it. And this is what they do. The only response they have it's just a It's violence and hate, yeah. yeah. And of course, this leads us to another issue because uh, this week is also the anniversary of uh, 20th uh, June 1981. It is the beginning of the establishment of the Islamic regime in Iran and it's the beginning of a massacre and slaughter of political prisoners. And in a sense, what you see in Orlando happened on a mass scale in Iran. Thousands upon thousands of people executed weekly, you know, uh, uh, culminating in uh, the sort of suppression of uh, opponents, but even anyone who they perceived to be opponents, so like people dancing in a gay club in Orlando, you know, d depending on how they were dressed, depending on, um, you know, whether they wanted to fast or not, all, all of these things. No, absolutely. And I think um, during those really dark uh, uh, months, uh, uh, Islamic regime took away a whole generation of free thinkers, atheists, apostates, you name it, the best of the um, Iranian society. Hundred and th hundred thousand people were executed by the Islamic regime. Until today. And uh, the thing is that this day is commemorated. It's a day which should be considered a crime against humanity. Yes. It has been recognized as such by uh, Iran Tribunal along with uh, events in 1988. But we continue to see its reflections in Iranian society today. For example, um, you've got uh, June 20th as a day to remember political prisoners in mm. Iran. People like Jafar Azimzadeh, who is now on over 40 days hunger strike. 
um, who's been sentenced to six years in prison uh, merely for a labor organizing. You've got someone like Nagis Mohammadi sentenced to 16 years in prison for human rights work and on and on. And this is continuing and we've just heard uh, that um, Nazanin Radcliffe, Nazanin Radcliffe yeah. has been actually charged with uh, sedation and uh, attempt to overthrow the Islamic regime of Iran. I With mean, her two-year-old child. And this is ridiculous. That's what the Islamists do yeah. day in, day out in Iran, trump up charges against innocent civilians. Yeah. And that's the nature of Islamist movement everywhere. And, uh, and I mean, in, in, in relation to um, uh, Nazanin, be calling all of our viewers and supporters to campaign for her freedom and that's important it's the case that actually goes to the uh, to show how the judiciary system and the Islamic regime in Iran operates yeah and of course there's also other cases like Jafar Azim so uh, there's a recent interview with his wife uh, where she talks about how uh, you know in danger he is given his long-term hunger strike and the fact that despite all odds he keeps uh, you know, um, struggling and fighting for uh, better uh, conditions for workers in Iran. And that's another case mm. that we need to support. And of course, this leads us also to the question of Ramadan. We are in the month of Ramadan. Uh, and uh, as uh, it is still the month of Ramadan, cheers. We, continue, we, are we continue to drink and, and uh, resist and defy uh, Ramadan. And that's important for us because when you look at cases like um, uh, Mr. Azimzadeh, Jafar Azimzadeh, mm. who is the their activist in, in prison in Iran, there is a huge sea of resistance and defiance in Iranian society and everywhere against the Islamists. And we need to recognize that and reflect that. And yeah. part of our campaign is really to, to show that. And with Ramadan in particular, I mean, people are saying, why are you trying to offend Muslims? Why let people fast if they want? But the point is that it's not that simple. People are not allowed to fast only if they want. Very yeah. often they're forced to do that. And just if you look at this month, alone the the few weeks that have passed so far we see that for example in Iran uh, places are being shut down people are being arrested for eating ISIS has, has crucified three men because they were caught eating uh, during times when they were meant to be fasting actually they've, they've declared that the month of Ramadan should be a month of calamity for the for non-muslim and for non-believers who, yeah. who, who defy in Morocco uh, recently um, uh, a, a gentleman who was drinking water, he's been arrested and he's been taken to court. Uh, young people have been arrested on For the For kissing during Ramadan, so that they've been arrested as well. You've got uh, people in Indonesia being arrested and being forced to do push-ups by the police because they were caught eating during and Ramadan. Part of, Ramadan is part of a state repression in many countries, in Iran, in Saudi Arabia, wherever Islamists ha um, have power. And that's why we want to defy that this is part of the resistance yeah. and, and and we need to reflect that resistance and dissent that exists in, yeah. in these societies. Sorry, there was also a case of a 90-year-old Hindu man in Pakistan yeah. who was beaten brutally by the police yeah. because he was caught eating during Ramadan. So it's about the state interfering. Uh, people, if they want to fast, they can. If they don't want to fast, they can. This is not an issue for the state. When the state intervenes, then it's repressive, then it's imposed. And we will stand with those who are persecuted rather than with these ridiculous norms and I, I agree um, cheers Mariam at the same time there is this element of normalization mm -hmm. uh, you'll see that major establishments um, in various European countries um, they try to sort of normalize this mm. you have the Home Office Minister comes and dick publicly um, goes on TV and sends a message of Ramadan. You have uh, shameful honestly you've had you have mayor of London you have the police in Victoria in a, um, in Australia, actually, they have a, a Ramadan feast in the evening for iftar. I mean, this is just disgusting. And I think what we need to do is to keep religion and religious institution out of public space. is private matter, and the state has no right to interfere in people's private issues. No right whatsoever. Defiance. A few weeks ago, I was in Washington, D.C., speaking at the magnificent Reason Rally. Watch my speech, and we'll come back to discuss it further. Stay with us. 
to bring our next speaker out. Um, every speaker, I'm asking them what their first car was and what the first piece of music that they bought with their own money was, as well as their bio. So our very next speaker is Mariam Namazi. Uh, Mariam, she's a political activist. She's the spokesperson for FITNA, which is the Movement for Women's Liberation and Other Civil Rights Groups. Bo uh, born in Iran, Mariam conducts activism for Iran, Canada, and Great Britain. Her first car is nothing because she's never driven, and her first music that she bought with her own money was a single by Donny Osmond. Perfect. Please welcome Mariam Namazi. Thank you very much. I'm so very happy to be here. I want to thank the wonderful organizers for this brilliant event and this weekend. And I also want to thank each and every one of you for coming out today. I think you should give yourselves a big round of applause for being here. It's well deserved. In the age of ISIS, in an age when we see the retreat of reason, being out loud and proud in defense of secularism and reason is important. If only to say, we exist. There are many of us. This, in and of itself, is important, whether in the US, whether in Iran, Saudi Arabia, or Afghanistan. It breaks the fear and the despair. It makes us feel and realize that we are not alone. It brings hope and with it courage. Being out loud and proud also means that we stand in solidarity with and honor our dissenters. People like Raif Badawi, sentenced to 10 years in prison and a thousand lashes in Saudi Arabia for merely raising the question of religion and politics. This month is his fourth year in prison. Walid Abul Khair, his lawyer and brother-in-law, who is also in jail. This month will be his birthday, another birthday spent in jail. Avijit Roy, the beloved Avijit Roy, and Bangladeshi atheist secularists and bloggers who are being hacked to death in broad daylight merely for defending reason. Avijit Roy widow, Bonya Ahmad, is here today, and I want to send out my sincerest respects to her. The likes of Fatima Naout, an Egyptian poet sentenced to three years in prison merely for criticizing Islamic animal slaughter. Activists of Raqqa is being slaughtered silently, literally dying to expose ISIS. Jafar Azimzadeh and labor activists in Iran facing long-term prison sentences and 17 gold mining workers who were recently flogged 30 to 100 times just for labor rights organizing. Nargis Mohammadi sentenced to 16 years in prison for human rights work, 16 years. And on and on. Wherever the theocrats have power, it is the beginning of the end of reason, the beginning of the end of free thought, freedoms, and rights for everyone. Despite this, there are some on the left, and I say this as someone who is firmly on the left myself, who defend Islamism as a defense of people's culture and religion. Thanks, but no thanks. Islamism is not our culture. It is the culture of our fascists. If it were people's culture, the theocrats would not need to ban everything, including music, like in Mali. Just last Thursday, the Iranian regime flogged 35 boys and girls for 
participating in a mixed gender graduation party. They received 99 lashes each. If, ev if everyone agreed with them, they would not need to terrorize populations through indiscriminate violence. There would not be mass migration from countries that they rule. Let's not forget Let's not forget that Islamism has been built on a slaughtered generations of the Middle East, North Africa, and South Asia, often with U.S. government complicity. Girls like 16-year-old Katya Bengana assassinated in the 90s in Algeria for refusing, for refusing to wear the veil. And political dissidents in Iran buried in mass graves in the Khavaran in the 80s in Iran after five-minute trial. Their murders are commemorated every year by their families and the mothers of Khavaran, despite arrests and abuse and threats by security guards. When people say that secularism is a Western neo-colonial demand, I don't know whether to laugh or to cry. Because no one understands the need, no one understands the need for the separation of religion from the state than those who live under the boot of the theocrats. And all theocrats, be it the Islamists, be it the Buddhist right, the Hindu right, the Jewish right, the Christian right. Of course, I know there are differences amongst and within this phenomenon. And of course, I know that the Islamists are the worst of them all because of the extent of the sheer power that they have. But fundamentally, the consequences of theocratic rule on people's lives is the same. The Buddhist right, massacring Muslims in Sri Lanka and Myanmar. The Hindu right, killing people for eating beef. The Jewish right, refusing to sit next to women on a plane. The Christian right, accusing children of witchcraft in Nigeria and bombing abortion clinics. And of course, the barbaric Islamists. Any degree of power for them means a corresponding degree of lack of rights and lives and freedoms for us. This is ignored by those on the left who side with the Islamists at the expense of our dissenters. I don't side with US militarism because I oppose the Iranian regime. They should learn to do the same. It's called multitasking. It's called fighting, fighting on several fronts at the same time. As Algerian sociologist Maria Mehele Lucas says, by supporting fundamentalists, this group simply chooses one camp in a political struggle without acknowledging it. The far right does the same. They conflate Muslims and migrants with Islamists and blame us all for the crimes of Islamism whether it's Pegida, whether it's Stop the War, sorry, Stop the War is the, uh, the left uh, um, apologist, Stop Islamization of America, the English Defense League, they shamefully place collective blame on dissenters, survivors, and victims. Look, I don't blame all Americans for the KKK, the bombing of Iraq, and Donald Trump. So please don't blame me for Islamic terrorism and Islamism. Stop defending, profiling of Muslims and calling for closed borders when victims who are fleeing Islamists need protection most. After all, this is not just a country of the KKK and Donald Trump. It is also the country of the 1912 Bread and Roses strikes of Joe Hill and of a vast, brilliant civil rights movement. This is why, this is why identity politics is so bogus. It erases social and political movements, class politics. The choices we make, where we stand, irrespective of our names, our places of birth, our immigration status. 
There is an atheist, for example, in every family that is presumed to be Muslim. There are ardent secularists amongst even the most ardent believers and in the smallest villages in the furthest corners of the globe. Dissent exists, often loud, proud, and out despite the risks. Like the unveiling movement in Iran, even though veiling is compulsory and punishable by imprisonment and fines. Or in Rojava, Syrian Kurdistan, where Sharia courts, forced marriages, and polygamy have been banned, and they are tearing down the rules that ISIS imposed on, the, on women's veiling. Identity politics or multiculturalism as a social policy makes it hard to see this immense dissent and our common humanity irrespective of our differences. It's the human being that has rights. It's the human being that should be sacred, not religions, cultures, and beliefs. When I tweeted that I was speaking here, I didn't do it on Facebook because they banned me yet again. Someone challenged me to prove why secularism is better when according to him, secularism brings AIDS and encourages the rape of women unlike Saudi Arabia, which is obviously a haven for women. My answer was simple. You have more rights in secular societies and no one gets legally thrown off of buildings for being gay. That's proof enough for me. Proof enough for me. In fact, secularism is a basic human right, as philosopher A.C. Grayling says. It's often conflated with atheism, but it's not just important for us atheists or religious minorities like Ahmadiyas and Baha'is, women, LGBTQ+, but everyone, including believers. After all, just because one is a believer doesn't mean one wants to live under the rule of the theocrats. The overflowing prisons, the overflowing gallows, the mass flight, unprecedented migration from countries where they rule is evidence of that. When government does God, it imposes religion on us all, says Richard Dawkins. And an imposition is no longer about the right to religion as a private matter, but about control and power. In the world that they want, everybody dies. In the world we want, everybody gets to live. <laughs> Nonetheless, we are the aggressive secularists, sometimes even, no joke, compared with the Taliban. Don't believe it, it's propaganda. In the world today, it is the secularists who are being slaughtered, not the other way around. They kill, they threaten our free thinkers, and we are accused of being offensive and censored in universities, in the media, by the likes of Ayatollah BBC, by Facebook. Shame on you, Facebook. Shame on you for constantly censoring the pages of Arab atheists, Bangladeshi atheists, Iranian atheists, and ex-Muslims, and by governments. As if, as if cartoons and blasphemy are more offensive than murder. We are accused of denying people's right to religion when we are merely fighting for a corresponding right to be free from religion and, of course, to live to tell the tale. When you can be killed for your atheism, and for criticism of Islam, criticism, by the way, that is much needed, normalizing and celebrating apostasy and blasphemy, out loud and proud are important forms of resistance. They kill, they maim, they kidnap our children, they bomb our schools and marketplaces, and we are accused of being unnecessarily provocative. No, we're just fighting back. We refuse to live on our knees. For many of us, the fight for secularism is a matter of life and death. It's not Western. 
It's not Eastern, it's universal. That is our message today from Washington, D.C. to Tehran, to Riyadh, to Dhaka, to Kabul, to Baghdad. We want secularism and we want it now. Thank you. Maryam Namazi. Wow. I hope you enjoyed Maryam's interview. She thinks she's done a brilliant job. But one striking thing for me was uh, Maryam. Um, it was the uh, being openly secularist and atheist and celebrating that and making that theme uh, um, an everyday theme for everybody. Yeah. Um, people should be out and about and be proud about it. And I think that's so important because part of uh, uh, you know, attack by the religious and part of the Islamists is to shut down and people not to declare that they are, you know, keep it private if you're secular, mm. keep it private as an atheist. Actually, no, we want to be open, openly secularist, openly atheist, openly free thinking, and have a place in the community. Yeah, I mean, thing. exactly. The, the, uh, this is something also that was often thrown at us when we started uh, the ex Muslim. Uh, council as well as uh, you know the hashtag ex-Muslim because it's you know don't offend don't come out you can do what you want just don't make it public mm. and I think the reality is that in fact when you're faced with a religious right-wing movement like the Islamists but not just them the Christian right the Hindu mm. right the Buddhist right the Jewish right it is important to speak up come out publicly it's an important way of fighting back and I think that's something that a lot of people are are recognizing today and I think Reason Rally is one of those important ways of pushing that agenda forward. And this has an impact on everybody else. There's a lot of people who have doubts about various yeah. uh, situations and the views and having people openly um, atheist, secularists and be proud of what they, they are helps other people to um, be brave to come out and show the real significance of this movement. Actually, majority of people in the world, in every country, they don't want religious and religious institution. Mm -hmm. And we need to create a space for them to be able to express that. Openly. Yeah, and even if they are religious, I mean, I think that's an important point. And also the fact that it's important for us to see beyond, you know, our uh, initial, our very um, local realities. and to see beyond uh, America, beyond Europe, and to see that there is a world out there of people who are struggling day in and day out to oppose the religious right, to defend secularism in various ways, and we need to stand with them, we need to be with them. They are part of us and we are part of them. The fatwa of this week is from Iran and it is from the Isfahan Friday prayers leader. His name is long really, name. really long and therefore he is really, really stupid. The shortest version is, is Taba Taba -i Nejad. Sayyid Yusuf Taba Taba -i Nejad. <sighs> anyway, he has said that the reason that the rivers are drying up in Iran is not because of global warming. No, of course not. It's not because of mismanagement, you know, mismanagement grave mismanagement by the regime. But it is because of women's immoral dress code in Iran, a country which, by the way, it is compulsory to veil. It's interesting because he said Very interesting. Uh, some photos have reached my office. Wow. And, um, Scientific photos, I hope. Uh, yes, yes. And um, it shows that some young people, girls, they are dressed immodestly by the Zaya and the Rude in Esfahan. And that's the cause <sighs> of the awful, awful, awful. In, in the city. And if you continue to do that, that's, that's the end of happen. all the rivers. I mean, I think because I'm not veiled, uh, the taps aren't working anymore. Oh no, they're off <laughs> running very much in here. But but at least we've got wine. It's Happy Ramadan. <laughs> the slice of life this week is a video of a young woman unveiled singing in a mosque in Iran. Now, of course, uh, you have to understand that in Iran, the veil is compulsory to the voices of women is banned. It's terrible. And she's singing in a mosque. 
Now, this is another example, and there are several videos of different women doing this. This is another example of women transgressing Islamist norms in order to live and breathe free. It's beautiful. Yes, and we leave you with this beautiful music and beautiful video. But before that, that brings us to the end of our program. We hope you enjoyed your program for this week, and we look forward to seeing you next week. Goodbye. Enjoy defying fasting rules. Enjoy. See you next week. Enjoy the music. تو را دوست دارم اگر دوست تو را دوست دارم اگر دوست دارم And I'm Fadi Bospuya. We're hosting a program called Bread and Roses. It's a weekly program that's broadcast in Persian and English in the Middle East and North Africa, primarily Iran as well. And it's also shown on YouTube internationally. And we've been doing this since last May. We're coming up to our year's anniversary. And yeah. we, we've had quite a lot of fun making these videos. We discuss taboo breaking, free thinking ideas. The Islamic regime of Iran has called us immoral and corrupt and that's why the, you need to support us we are and the alternative voice in Middle East and North Africa of corruption and immorality so do support us here's a short video from patreon that explains how you can help us with even just one dollar a week that's nothing support us patreon lets fans become patrons of their favorite artists and content creators it's different than Kickstarter because it's not about one big project that requires lots of funding. It's more for bloggers or YouTubers or web comics, anyone who creates on a regular basis. Here's how it works. When you become a patron, you're agreeing to give an artist a tip of an amount you set every time they release a piece of content, whether it's a new song, a video, or a recipe. You can set a monthly maximum to make sure that you're always within your budget. Choose an amount, enter your payment information, and you're done. Becoming a patron allows you to view and post in the artist's stream, and in exchange for your support, artists offer additional patron packages, which might include monthly Google Hangouts, music production tutorials, pre-sale concert tickets, or anything they can offer as a way to say thanks. Patreon, empowering a new generation of content creators.